Hello and welcome to the 10th episode of the Wanderings podcast. My name is Pedro Bonato and I am a photographer and musician that creates artworks inspired by history, mythology and traditions from around the world. My goal with this show is to share the creativity of the people who have inspired my own journey and how they were able to bring their vision to life in the intersections of art, science and business. But today's episode will be a little different. This will be my first solo show with no guests. Um, I realized I never really properly introduced myself and my work to you as you've been listening for a while. So I decided to hijack this episode and tell a bit of my story and put some context to the podcast and my work. Next week, we'll be back to our regular interviews But for today, I felt I should share some personal things that I'm going through. I hope it will be interesting and useful to you. Um, If you're like me, listening to the honest account of a person's struggles and dreams always brings some sort of clarity and insights into our own path. I've been in sort of a crossroads lately, and I decided to come out with a bunch of new projects this week and start sort of a personal transformation. I thought it would be nice to share this with uh, the listeners of the podcast. I was really, really, really hesitant about releasing the solo episode, but um, I was reminded by designer Ella Luna, who once said, I think on an interview with Chase Jarvis, she said, you never know, you just never know who is out there waiting, waiting, for exactly what you have to give. So today, I want to give you a bit of my origin story. This is my manifesto, my current state of the union, the documenting of a new beginning, a personal renaissance, and I hope you'll enjoy it. Let's start by letting me tell you um, why I finally decided to record this and start all the new projects I've been working on. I love creating images and music, but as I learned it's the case with many artists, my Achilles heel has always been actually putting the work out there. Seems silly for non-artists, but apparently it's a thing. I also love talking about images, the inspirations behind them, the process of creation. I often discuss these things with uh, my wife and she kept saying for a long time, you should start a vlog or something and put these ideas out there. In principle, I liked the idea, but I could never really get started. Uh, I felt like a fraud, it's what they call the imposter syndrome. I felt, to be honest, I was not good enough. I worried what would people would think um, and if they, if they would care at all. So I kept postponing it, procrastinating it. Then last month, I got back into listening to the content of a guy named Gary Vaynerchuk, who is um, sort of an interesting entrepreneur. And he said a couple of things that literally changed my perspective. He said, your lack of action is exposing your insecurities. And he also said that we do not do things because we are afraid to be judged by others of others will think, and especially what they will say if you fail. All that felt um, quite true, quite um, close to home. I started asking myself what was the source of these insecurities. And one word kept coming to mind. Shame. I was ashamed I was not already at the level I wanted to be at, both in terms of career and artistic ability. I am 40 years old now. Ashamed I was not trying hard enough and that my lack of discipline um, when it came to the things that I held dear to my heart was lacking. I can work hard for a client, for a friend, but for whatever reason, whenever it's time for me to push hard for myself, I couldn't do it. The most uh, terrifying realization was if I'm honest with myself, is that I was ashamed I hadn't made it yet and I knew it was my fault. Worst, I thought my shame was actually silly. I should know better. 
These are all tricks of the mind. Some people have disease, poverty, broken hearts, limbs. I have none of those things. What's the matter with me? So I realized I was rationalizing the shame in a variety of clever ways. I was not ready yet. I had to get more work done, have my photographs shown in big galleries somewhere, uh, somehow get recognition, validation. Then I would be ready to speak. Uh, but Gary addressed that specific issue as well, squeezing excuses. He said that you should document the journey you are actually into. Document the process and fall in love with the grind. He also said something that uh, hit hard. He said that my failures are my own and no one else's. Why would you care what other people think? That actually made me remember the exact same quote from my favorite uh, physicist, uh, Richard Feynman. There is even a book called, What Do You Care What Other People Think? Another thing had a subtle but very important impact. As I was listening to author Neil Gaiman in his uh, writing course on Masterclass, this one phrase echoed in my mind. He was talking about the importance of fiction and its relationship to truth which I realized is at the core of my interest in photography and music for that matter. He said, fairy tales are more than true, not because they tell us that dragons exist, but because they tell us that dragons can be beaten. It seemed very simple, but it was very powerful to me. Dragons can be beaten. That meant you have to pick up your sword, and engage with them. The last drop to get started was a random post on Instagram by photographer Chase Jarvis. It simply said, I think you should go for it. Then that was the drop. That and remembering my wife, then Soriana Komarnitska, saying to me a while back when I was complaining about not having started something, when she said with her beautiful Ukrainian pragmatism, um, next time, don't wait. So here we are. And you start with three new projects and picking up some old ones. And as promised, here is my origin story. What I mean by origin story is actually a reference to superheroes. I'm still a boy, 15 years old at heart. So in case you were not one of those things, or if you're not into uh, superheroes, I must tell you. Usually on the first few issue of a comic book, they tell this story of how the hero got their powers and what compelled him or her to act. And I think the hero metaphor is a very powerful one. And I think it actually applies to all of us. So I'm not going to give you a long life story, but I'll tell you about three moments that actually changed my life. So let's get started. So I was born in the south of Brazil and I picked up my camera for the first time when I was 14 and I actually fell in love with it. Um, since then, I tried many different paths. I was an actor, I created an audiobook company, I started studying physics because I loved astronomy and science. I wanted to be a filmmaker. I started playing Arabic drums. But the problem has always been that I had too many interests, no direction, and to make matters worse, a terrible lack of discipline. I was considered somewhat smart and creative, but, well, actually I could pick up things easily at first, but I never capped at it. I would get to a certain level of mastery, then when effort was actually required to find the next level, I actually went into some other shiny thing to get obsessed over. The one thing I kept actually learning little by little, always coming back to, was photography and drumming, actually. But after screwing up a lot of things and in the, my mid-20s, sorry, my mid-20s, I decided to move to Brasilia, the capital of Brazil, and become a government employee. Um, <laughs> the only thing my college degree in advertising ever helped me with was actually securing that job in the Ministry of Science and Technology as a communications analyst. I was 25, I had tenure, which means I could not get fired, and I was trying desperately to make that job count. 
I had given up the dream of becoming an astronomer, but I had a new dream of helping with uh, popularizing science. But as you can imagine, it's very hard, especially in a third world country, to get any job that is meaningful done in the government, even when your job description is exactly to do that. Science communication, science popularization. It was an uphill battle for five years every time. There was a lot of corruption and political interests and general stupidity. And I felt very frustrated. I was doing, to be fair, a lot of photojournalism work for my job, visiting a lot of science institutions around the country, documenting their buildings, their people, their work. But secretly, I wanted not to document images, I wanted to create them. I was in love with fashion and fine art, but it was impractical and it seemed like something not worth pursuing. I was following the work of a photographer named Peter Hegre that was creating beautiful photographs, but I didn't think I could do anything like that. So I focused on my work in the ministry. I tried to create some content to inspire people to appreciate and pursue science as much as I loved it, and how art and design could help in that quest. But I was miserable and lost, and I didn't know what my voice was or purpose. I was still playing whenever I could, the Arabic drums and taking photos on the weekends, and uh, I was thinking of business ideas. I had an urge to travel, but I did not know who I was or what I wanted to do. I certainly did not want to continue in the ministry and become one of those guys with no passions and, I don't know, like coffee stains on the back of their shirts, which I actually saw once. So let me tell you about this one night. I was alone in my home and there was a terrible storm. The lights went out and as it often did when it rained in Brasilia, the lights stayed off and there was no chance they would come back anytime. And the rain was so heavy that I didn't feel like going for a ride. It was pitch black, and I was in the middle of my living room. I had these two small balconies in my apartment, one facing south and the other facing north. With the windows open, I could hear water hitting the floors on both sides. I thought, I'm hearing the skies crying out in stereo. Which side was louder? So I decided to light a candle and pick up a notebook. I had read an article somewhere about what to do when you're stuck. It suggested you to write 75 things that you want to do, learn, experience, accomplish. In no particular order, big, small, practical, absurd, it doesn't matter. The trick was to allow yourself to dream, to keep writing. Of course, I had been postponing doing that, but that night in my little dark cave, I felt I should do it. What else can I do? This was before iPhones and all those things. I sat down in my living room with the rain behind and uh, I began to write. At the end, I had a list of more than a hundred things. They started to get surprising and interesting around number 40. It had things like uh, walk the pyramids at night, which I haven't done yet. Play drums for a professional ballet dancer. Start and sell a company. Design science curriculum around art. Have a world music band. Have a fine art photography exhibit. That one hit me hard. The article said it was not about creating a to-do list, but identifying the themes that make you feel alive by taking a look at all those things you you wrote down. And the funny thing is that there was this sort of like voice, a decision that kept yelling from the pages. Go travel. Get out. This is not your place. Um, The lights went back like after around six hours. I didn't know it then, but that night actually changed the course of my life. I actually forgot about the list. I went back to my work, but I started looking into ways of going abroad, probably to study. I was still in that mentality of being a student and not a practitioner. Um, I found some MBA programs in California, Toronto, and uh, even Finland. I was 29, 
And I found out that I could actually leave my job, uh, take a leave, an unpaid leave of absence from my job and go study. So it happened that a year later, I was moving to Toronto, Canada. And I was not accepted in any of the MBA programs I was applying for. But I found by chance a course that looked promising. It was an interdisciplinary master's in art, media, and design. And they actually accepted me. I proposed to do a project about science and art in the field of design, science popularization, all those things that I thought were practical and interesting. Photography and music were lurking in the background. But this master's was meant to be something artistic, but practical. After six months in the program, I thought I was doing worse than in the government job. And maybe I'll tell that story sometime if you're interested. But for now, I want to tell you that that was actually the beginning of a second time that there was a big change in my life. I had this um, experimental class, one where you could do work in any field of interest, design, photography, pottery, 3D, whatever. I ended up doing all those things. But the university had a huge studio, photo studio. It had lights, it had cameras, it had all those things I had never really used before. And to be honest, didn't even know how to use it properly. I had read about it, but I had never actually learned how to use strobes and shape light according to my will. The class was an excuse to try things out. It was uh, a way for you to get out of your own back, to give yourself permission. So I thought, well, how can I combine my interest in photography, specifically with science? Something that would be inspirational and personal to myself. Something that didn't have to be practical. I decided I wanted to do a creative portrait. I wanted to reimagine some of my favorite characters in the history of science. And I chose to start with this woman called Hypatia of Alexandria. She was an astronomer, a philosopher, she was a poet, and she was the last director of the Library of Alexandria. She was said to be a woman of great beauty and intellect, and she had no intention to marry. Even in ancient Alexandria, she moved up a men's world to the highest science position at the time. She was also the inventor of a very curious artifact called a flat astrolabe. Sort of like the iPhone of its time, a device that was used for navigation and timekeeping before there were watches or compasses or things like that. Her invention was used by sailors until at least the 16th century, a thousand years after her death. I was fascinated by her story. It took place during the times of the early church. And unfortunately, a bishop named Cyril sent a mob to kill her on her way to work. She was accused of paganism, witchcraft, and her body was cut to pieces with abalone shells. It was, in a way, the end of an era, the rise of the church, the Dark Ages, the burning of the Alexandria Library, and that has always stayed in my mind since I heard about her when I was, I don't know, 16, 17. I had this vision of Hypatia as a goddess of astronomy, a siren that for a thousand years would lead ships to safety, thanks to her invention, the astrolabe, her lasting contribution to the world. It was a product of curiosity, intellect, and creativity at the same time, an object of amazing beauty. You should go check it out. I thought I wanted with this photograph to celebrate her somehow, celebrate her life. Instead of cuts around her body, as I've seen some artists portray her before, I thought her legacy was actually knowledge pouring through her skin. So I invited this dancer friend of mine and the body paint artist to help me create this image. When I went into the studio, I really felt in my element. Time disappeared, I was playing. I deeply cared for what I was doing. It was really a magical moment and it has been the case ever since. Every time I get ready to create a photograph, I can't help but get into that zone. I ended up printing the image, showing in class, and it started my first fine art photography series, Portraits of Science. 
in my first and only one so far solo exhibition. That was eight years ago. The third and last moment I wanted to touch on, and this will be short, was actually when I met my wife. We were creating our first photos together, and we stayed up until 7 a.m. talking about our hopes and dreams and all the artistic things we wanted to do. And in a very real way, it was inspired by her, since we started working together, that I was able to unlock a lot of that artistic potential by creating a bunch of new fine art series. I had some work in fashion as I wanted. I actually, we both together created a world music band and we did get, sorry, in the end, I did get to travel and play drums for her, who is a professional dancer, as I had written in that list so long ago during the night of the storm. But as I said in the beginning, I didn't put enough effort not nearly enough in all my projects. I didn't contact enough galleries to show my work or agencies to do shoots for companies or causes that I believe in. And I didn't know why, what was stopping me until very recently. I think it's because I thought my work was self-serving and not important. Who was I to dare to want to inspire people? Uh, this is such a cliche. Where was my North Star? What was the value that I was going to provide to people? Who would pay to have my art hanging on their walls? As I said, it's very hard to talk about this, and it has been a very transformative year uh, in many ways. When I was in Ukraine earlier in February, I saw this fantastic exhibit by this guy named Android Jones, which combined all the things that I wanted to do, music, photography, audio, video, all in one experience. And I looked at that and I knew that's what I want to do. It can be done, but I did not know the why. And watching that exhibit basically gave me a kick in the back to start doing things. So last month I decided to actually sit and do this exercise by psychologist Jordan Peterson. He suggested to ask yourself why. Sit at the edge of your bed and ask and listen. Strangely, some answers did come and they didn't seem to be me talking to myself as if I'm thinking. They seem to be actually something else inside me telling me that as if it was a response that was there already. Actually, I had written all those things in a letter to my wife a few years ago. And it was so strange to have a revelation of something you knew already. Something that actually Dante Alighieri uh, 700 years ago said, beauty awakens the soul to act. It sort of said in my head, Pedro, find the North Star that you're seeking out and aim at it. And your job is to create beauty, dude. He actually said dude, it's kind of funny. Um, photos like music, I came to realize, are like magical portals. They're glimpses into another world, a world of potential. They're clues in our own journey to find who we truly are. And the strange realization that came when I was sitting at the edge of my bed was, that's the gift, however small, that I can give to the world. It all sort of came together, my interest in history and mythology, my love for combining cultures in music or in ethnic fashion, all of this culminating in the creation of an idealized world. An idealized world in the sense of it is a personal star, something you want to aim at, something you want to be reminded of, something that reminds you of your aspirations, of your goals. And the weird thing was that I noticed that I was doing that all along. I just didn't feel confident that I had the right to pursue it, to chase it unapologetically. Beauty awakens the soul to act. And my job is to create beauty. It's that simple. Which leads me to today. Now I sit on my living room in Toronto, but to call it my living room is actually incorrect. This is our art palace. This is our studio. It's where 
There were a lot of things started and a lot of things almost started. I have almost no furniture here. It's basically a place with a mirror and window light so that we can create our work. I know that we as artists carry all those things inside. We do not need those elements to actually create art, but it does help. So I'd like to finish this little tale with a description of the new projects I'm working on, all inspired by the story that I told you, this new beginning. They are the culmination of my quest, continuing quest, for courage and discipline and to put my work out there in the hope that someone would be interested and find it inspiring. So the first project I'm working on is my vlog. I call it the story of an image where I share the process of creating photographs, the inspiration behind them, and the struggles and the bliss of an artist's life. Basically, it's the conversations I like to have with my friends, fellow artists, my wife, and I want to share them with you. The first episode will actually talk about the Hypatia photograph I mentioned earlier, and I hope you will check it out and enjoy it. Also, I must say that the inspiration to start this vlog came from, again, from uh, Gary Vaynerchuk, who did this compelling argument to start documenting your journey that I could not deny. Wasn't it amazing to see glimpses of the daily lives of our ancestors? I would absolutely love to see my great-grandfather coming from Europe to Brazil and see how he started his first newspaper, how he got involved into the movement to free the slaves in Brazil. But that's all gone. There may be fragments here and there, but it's all gone for the most part. But Gary said that because of the internet, we are the first generation, actually no matter how old we are, that will have a permanent record in photography, video, audio, that will last 50, 100, 200 years, 1,000 years, until basically we blow ourselves up or a comet strikes. That information will be there for the next generations. That information will be hopefully useful. And not only that, all our future uh, descendants, our great, 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 great grandchildren will be able to track back their origins to us. And I thought that was so powerful. It's as if we all became pharaohs and lived forever. So it's a vlog in that sense is not just entertainment or promotion. It's actually a time machine. And I, I actually want to have a daughter or son one day soon. And I think they would have a kick, at least that, out of seeing their old man in the, his early adventures. Even if they'll cringe at how silly I can be. We, I know for a fact that we always think our parents are either heroes or, oh God, mom, right? So that alone would be worth it. So the second project is called The DNA of Music. I already recorded two episodes for this show and they're coming out next week. The DNA of Music is a video program where I interview musicians from traditions from around the world and we talk about their process, their influence, and we also recorded solo performances where you can hear traditional instruments, elements of their culture, and you go a little bit deeper into the stories of these ancient songs and how they are bringing this tradition to life in a 21st century context. This will be part of a larger project in photography, music, and theatrical show that I'm working on, but I wanted to start sharing this love for world music right away and show how connected we are in this planet and start through music. The third and final project, and thank you for bearing with me so far, is actually still a little bit in the fear zone for me. It's my current dragon, the one I still have to beat. My goal is to offer people that like my work a chance to support it, to be a part of it, and to get some of my photographs to bring to their homes, to their offices, to give as gifts. As you'll see later in my vlog, my house is filled with artworks from friends, artists, and items I have collected over the years. To me, they are portals, they are reminders. They are these beautiful things that inspired me to act. Um, now that I think of it, the first artwork I ever bought 
was actually a postcard. It was a reproduction of a little part of a painting by a guy named uh, John William Waterhouse called Hillas. I think that's how you pronounce it, Hillas and the Nymphs. It's a painting from 1820 something, and it has a lot of the elements that has have inspired my photography and my interest in mythology and all that. I was 15 when I first saw this at this bookstore, and I really felt compelled to buy it. It was, in a way, my first portal. With that single postcard 25 years ago, which still hangs on my wall, I started a little transformation, and I <laughs> actually didn't know what it meant until I started recording this. So I decided to find a way to make my work available for people who want to have it. So I decided to get my photos in three formats. Postcards, small posters you can frame and put on your walls, and this larger limited edition prints. I was inspired to create this by how books are sold. You have inexpensive paperback editions, then you have hardcover books, which are fancy and nice, and then you have the rare first editions, handmade books. I think there is space for all of it. So I decided to, to use, unfortunately, cliche word, word of our time, but it's very, very real, to be vulnerable and put this work out there in these formats and... Uh, hopefully use the power of the internet and of crowdfunding to bring these works to the people that would like to have it. So I created this project, which I'll be launching next week. It's called The Postcard Club. I will use services like Patreon and Subscribestar, where people will be able to become patrons of my work and get monthly handmade signed postcards delivered to their houses. If you become a sponsor, you'll be able to get discounts on prints or posters and have early access to my collections. And if you're not interested in that, you'll be able to go to my website and take a look at the photos that are available and get them there too. As I said, and you can probably hear in my voice, uh, all fears kick into gear as I say this, because it's very hard for an artist to become a salesperson. But the way that I learned to see it is to give the opportunity for people to appreciate your work and to see that as a gift you can actually give to the world, independently if they, that specific person at that specific time want it or not. I have had this idea for this project for almost two years now, maybe more. But the idea of actually sharing my art with you is speaking louder. And I want you to be a part of the creation of new art, of new portals, in this mission to awaken souls to act. So this is my origin story. Thank you from the bottom of my heart for listening. It means the world to me if you have come so far. Whether you hear this message tomorrow or in a time capsule in 2049 or 3049, if we still have English as a language, and haven't been killed by all the robots or Cylons, I hope this message will serve as a little spark, maybe just a little candle in the dark, to ignite a small revolution in your own life. And I would love to hear your feedback. Let me know if you want to see more of these solo episodes from time to time, if I should stick to interviews, and if you have any questions, or just a message saying, hello, I heard you, if you feel inspired to do so. So for now, as always, I invite you to follow your curiosity. And if something that I've been learning throughout my life is to pick up your sword, the one, the one only you can take out of the stone. And remember, dragons can be beaten. So that's it for today's show. Thank you for listening to The Wanderings Podcast. You can find show notes and links at pedrobonato.com slash podcast. If you like the show, I would love if you could share it with your friends or leave a review on iTunes. If you want to get in touch with me, you can find me on all social media at Pedro Bonato. I would love to hear from you. You can find my photography work at pedrobonato.com.
The music for the Wanderings podcast is provided by the Blue Dot Ensemble, a music and dance group exploring traditions from all over the planet, where I am one of the founders and the lead drummer. You can find us at bluedotensemble.com. So tune in next week for another show. Until then, I urge you to keep following your curiosity, and I'm looking forward to our next Wanderings together. Together.